Ahoy hoy. I'm Paul Jarvis, and you're listening to Call Paul. I'm currently the co-founder of Fathom Analytics, which is like Google Analytics, but privacy-focused and easy to use. I've also run a bunch of small but mighty businesses for the last 20 plus years, and I'm the author of Company of One, a book about intentionally growing a small business. In this season of Call Paul, we're talking to small business owners who are in it not just for financial reasons, but for a place to act on their values and make a real difference in their industry. And I know from experience that those two things don't have to be in opposition. They can, in fact, be complementary in the long term. Sometimes the simple act of a business existing can be subversive. For example, if you're a small farm who doesn't use genetically modified seeds, considers sustainability, and is active on boards to represent small-scale farming, then you are bucking the system. You know, the longer we're here and the more of us there are, the more drops in the bucket, I think we can change it. But I have to hold on to an overall picture that it's not just me and my generation. You know, I got inspired by the people doing it before me who were inspired by people. That's Joe, the owner of Dirty Girl Produce, a 40-acre farm in Santa Cruz, California. The way that they grow food considers the workers, the soil, the water, the tools, and the technology, basically the entire horticultural system. Oh, and if you're wondering why a guy named Joe owns a farm called Dirty Girl, I was curious too. I am a radical eco-feminist for sure, hardcore, you know, equality, social justice for everybody. It's not a weird derogatory name that a a white man made up, right? So when I was learning to farm, I went to the homeless garden in Santa Cruz and there was a woman, Jane Friedman. She was the manager there and she was like charismatic Jane. She's from the East Coast. She's like, she's just so strong. She's tiny, but she's just strong and fierce and everybody loves her and and all her friends would come to the garden, you know, and so she's just like the center point. And she's really who showed me that farming is really freaking cool and fun. And there's a community to it and all this stuff. Right. And Jane and, and, and her friend Allie started a farm. They call it Fantam Farms. And then they changed the name to Dirty Girl Produces. And I worked for Jane and Allie for two years, the Dirty Girls. And I could see that they were kind of wanted out. And this is the only three acres that is in the city of Santa Cruz. So I basically just kind of hung on and let them transition out, gave them some money for all the equipment and everything. And I just kept farming under Dirty Girl Produce. And it was cool because at first I didn't want any attention. And I, it was kind of like, you know, there was like this, you know, myth of these two women that had, were Dirty Girl Produce. And it turned out it was me, you know, running it from that point on. But I just hid behind it. And if anybody ever asked me weird stuff about it, I said, yeah, it honors the the, the women that, you know, taught me about farming. So who better to honor than those that come before us? Yeah, I guess that then makes sense why it's called Dirty Girl. Can you, I guess, describe the farm then, the land and the vibe for our listeners? So we definitely have a Santa Cruz vibe. We grow a mix of organic row crop veggies, tomatoes, and strawberries. So about, you know, anywhere from 40 to 90 items. And we market them mainly around Santa Cruz, San Francisco, and the East Bay area. Uh, we also do some shipping outside of the state, especially in tomato season, a little bit in strawberry season, but we mostly sell local. Cool. And I guess, what does a typical day look like for you? Is it mostly farming? Are you doing farming and other stuff? Is it mostly other stuff nowadays? Yeah, well, nowadays I really do a lot of administrative work. I carry my laptop around me everywhere with my phone and my earbuds. Right now we I have really good people on the tractor and in the field and picking and post-harvest handling and sorting and doing markets and stuff. So wherever the fire is, that's where I go. <laughs> How have things changed through the pandemic? It's all about, you know, trying to figure out where you're selling stuff, what you can grow and, and how everything's changing. And you got to meet that before, you know, you have thousands of dollars worth of product and all of a sudden no one wants it anymore. They only wanted it last year. That's been going on pretty big time last couple of years. And so I've just been really kind of riding that out and trying to really navigate the changing marketplace. Um, We probably have like 
15 to 25 percent of our sales go to restaurants in the in the san francisco bay area and that went down to like zero or one percent during the the beginning of the pandemic when all the restaurants shut down and then even after that you know the the restaurants are struggling i mean i just really been kind of on that um and just trying to make sure we lose as little as possible you know um winning yeah that's always good but really like as a farmer you just want to not lose you almost have to predict i guess what the market wants right yeah well it's like years in the making you know you, you don't just jump in a lot of times like people will start farming after they have had a career so they have a little bit of money to, to, to throw around and, and 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 you quickly lose it you know you really do because you oh i'm excited about romano beans so you plant a whole bunch of romano beans and then you realize man it's a lot to pick all these Romano beans and who's going to buy them. If you haven't sold Romano beans to 100 people last year, it's kind of a big ask to think that you can go and sell them to 100 people this year. So I think that happens a lot in farming. It's weird. Before the pandemic, I actually moved uh, with my family. I got three little kids and my wife and, and we moved to Oaxaca City. And I was uh, I had a manager to kind of run the day to day here, but I was I was online and on the phone all day every day you know from from doing it remote and my goal was to go there and get um all the administrative stuff with our farm online and just upgrade everything we're going to go e-commerce there's so many choices in so many different ways and and i just really saw the the pressure to to get more um organized online we you know we really had to start from the beginning in a lot of ways and so just navigating that kind of e-commerce space and also our store with barn to door that's where we sell you know uh full retail uh product line of farm box salad box hearty veg box we have canned tomatoes we have strawberry boxes and tomato boxes you can buy online for delivery for pickup you know it's just a really a lot i still have yet to fully reap the benefits of it you know because we're still having a little bit of trouble technically getting everything in at the right time. And it's like, a, it's a huge challenge. You can't just jump into this game. You know, you got to start out slow. You got to go learn from other people. Otherwise you're just going to be losing money. And that's what farmers are really good at. <laughs> well, how did you get started? Like what, what's, what's the origin story there? It's funny. Like I was kind of a surf jock in high school, you know, I liked the competitive surfer. Like I was really into it. I was going to be a pro surfer. Um, I moved down to San Diego and I was competing a lot and, and doing school, but not even thinking about school. Like I just get my classes all on Tuesday and Thursday so I can surf all the other days. And then once you start going to university, you start thinking about all the problems in the world, environmental problems, you know, we were seeing it way back then. I did an independent major at UCS. I ended up finishing up calling eco psychology that, that takes, um, that looks at the, the study of how humans interact with nature and how nature interacts with us, you know, how it affects us. And I also met so many people that would come through the garden and, and that worked on farms, small organic farms, and they'd work on a farm somewhere and then they'd take off in the winter and they'd travel. And I'm like, sign me up, you know, wow. I started kind of really traveling around and uh, visiting farms and working on farms, managing farms and uh, trying to learn everything. So, I, you know, I'm just really inspired by all that stuff and, and just found meaning in farming, right? And, and it's great when you don't have to worry about money because, you know, like they say, what did the, the farmer do when he won the lottery? He just kept farming until he spent it all. <laughs> and, and you can do that. I, I just think that, that most farms, like old farmers, you know, you talk to them and they've gone bankrupt at least once. And I think the hardest thing is to survive emotionally you're going to lose it eventually. Nature will smack you down. It's a huge risk. It's a really big gamble. But, you know, I'm just trying to bring a new wave of um, actually like right in the coattails of everybody came before me and, and, and getting into a new wave of, of different, you know, economic mo models where you can make it more uh, economically and socially and environmentally viable to be a farmer. An incredible organic, sustainable, regenerative farm system will help the earth and an industrialized one will absolutely destroy it for us, at least. I guess I'm curious a bit more um, why growing food is so important. And I guess in the context of specifically and especially in the way that you grow food um, at Dirty Girl. Yeah, 
Right. How do you save the world through growing food the right way? <laughs> yeah. Right, right. No, totally. Everything, that, all the inputs that we put into farming and the way we treat the soil um, affect our, not just that place, but everywhere else. You know, if, if we have an industrialized food system that is creating a product that is less healthy for us, it's affecting our health. But also on the farm, everything you put in the farm doesn't stay on the farm. It's inter we're in an interconnected web. So if you spray Roundup on, you're not guaranteeing that that Roundup stays there. You all the nitrate nitrate based fertilizers that can you know leach into water wells or go into rivers and creeks when it's raining all affect everybody downstream. And we've just had a long couple hundred years now of farming as just utter capitalism, right? So we're just trying to make make money. And what's the best way to do that is, you know, you, you decrease your cost and you increase your sales, right? So you get a net profit. And, and in that, sometimes the cheapest way to do it is invest into these products that are dangerous and into these systems that are, that are dangerous. And so if we have a system where we are um, farming at the expense of nature, you know, we're, having, we're, we're losing soil, we're using harmful chemicals. So we're poisoning everything and everybody in the process right now in California, water is huge. It's got huge industry coming, buying all these, all this land with all this water rights to grow all these al almonds for export in California. And it's, you know, it's, it's depleting the rivers. It's depleting the salmon. They're not able to uh, regenerate because the water's too warm and they, the spawn die. There's full townships that are losing water. I mean, there's all kinds of, of, of ways that we've blown it in industrializing our food production, you know, and, and really just kind of trusting the free market and capitalism to say, ah, it'll just take care of itself, right? Well, no, it won't. You know, you're gonna, we're gonna farm to the very bitter end and just ruin everything if we don't regulate. You can farm without fossil fuels, you know, it's hard because it's the industry has not adapted to this, but I think we really got to get into electric engines. Mm -hmm than you know just like we're getting into with cars and it's like god it's so overdue you know so i don't know there's it's it's hard to it's hard to really reconcile like you know trying to make a living with trying to be a, almost an activist you know that's like i, I got into yeah. for a reason is because i want to change it hey i wanted to pause for a quick break if you're enjoying this season of call paul You'll love a small business story from our friends at Courier, a magazine about working better and living smarter. Jacob Green's lightning bolt moment came on a run on London's Hampstead Heath. His shoes were on the way out and he saw a disconnect when he looked down. I was in this beautiful green space, but wearing a load of plastics on my feet, which would end up in a landfill somewhere, he said. Jacob called his friend Michael Doty, a vegan soccer player, who was excited to hear the idea for a performance-driven running shoe that would be good for the planet. Soon, they were meeting with John Prescott, a veteran of Nike, Adidas, Puma, and Asics. Today, the trio run the sports shoe brand Hilo Athletics on a mission to create the most sustainable possible version and ultimately compete with the industry's giant brands. For the full story, head to couriermedia.com. And if you want more stories like this, you can sign up for their weekly newsletter at couriermedia.com slash email. Does it feel, I guess, like subversive or like, do you feel brave for doing things in the way that you're doing them that's different than the the standard or typical farming industrial complex yeah for sure farming is definitely subversive if you grow up middle class and you want to be a farmer you really are stepping down the ladder as far as your opportunity to to earn earn a living you know it's just so much easier to do just about any job 
just about anything earns more and is less risky than farming. Not that there isn't a lot of low pay, you know, low paying stuff and a lot of risk out there. All small businesses, everybody's taking a risk, you know? So I, I do feel that you do have to really, you know, yeah, subvert the dominant paradigm, right? I always love, I always love that saying. And that's what exactly what I'm doing. I have a grandfather passed away. He'd be like 104 now. He grew up in Kansas. And uh, his dad worked on the railroad. He grew up on a farm. And uh, so he knew, you know, he, he, he did have years where the wheat prices were just like garbage, you know, they just eat it. And so he got out of there and became a pilot for Pan Am and, and as soon as he could. And so my, my grandpa tells me when I, you know, I'm like 19, 20, just getting into it. And he's like, hey, if you want to make money as a farmer, go work for Dow Chemical. Go work for the chemical or the fertilizer companies. Go, you know, he's like, don't do the farm, you know, and I'm like, grandpa, but that's the whole point. You're not getting, <laughs> you're not getting the point. You know, the point is I want to do it different. If you just worry about everything, uh, you got to be able to ha handle a lot of anxiety and a lot of worry and a lot of stress, especially when, you know, it's a lot harder with family. You know, I, I definitely hits me harder sometimes, but then I just get into um, a certain mode where I just, you know, I believe in what I'm doing. I feel encouraged by a lot of people around me, makes people happy that I'm doing what I'm doing. And I'm able to actually do that and live, you know, middle class, you know, lifestyle in Santa Cruz. There's not a, there's not a lot of people that do it, you know, that can do it. And, and so I think I'm really lucky and I'm privileged that I can. And I think it's, I kind of weave, you know, between people like I'm, I'm, comfortable on the farm. I'm also comfortable with people that work in restaurants and, um, you know, getting, getting on the phone with someone that's like works in tech, you know, these are all my people. I don't feel like there's a separation. And I, I feel like a lot of times farming has sort of a polarization, like you're in the field and those are city, city folks over there. I got nothing to do with them. You know, like, you know, yeah, except you're raising beef and you got to sell the, the cow and you got to, these are the people that are buying it. Right. Does this ever just feel discouraging. I mean, sustainability in farming is obviously a global issue, but I can imagine that it would also feel maybe isolating to be one of the few taking a hit in order to do things the right way. It's just tricky being a drop in the bucket. It works so long as the system as a whole moves towards a more sustainable agriculture, right? Now we, I know a lot of people that are doing it. Santa Cruz County, we have so much organic. We have so many good uh, farms to that people come and visit that model that come from different countries to come to California. It's Santa Cruz County. It's amazing. So you know, Santa Cruz is is like a hotbed. It's where CCOF, California Certified Organic Farmers, started. They were the first ones to certify organic, and then the USDA standard for for organic agriculture. These were originally drafted and edited from CCOF's document. That's Santa Cruz. CCOF headquarters in Santa Cruz. And it's been this just hotbed of people to come in, learn about sustainable horticulture and go bring it somewhere else. There's always a, every year there's someone from Kenya. Uh, you know, there's always someone from like Australia, England, anywhere, Europe. And of course, a bunch of people from the US, you know. So the longer we're here and the more of us there are, the more drops in the bucket, I think we can change it. I think there's something to be said too about people taking the same subversion at the same time in the same place where technically you would be competing with other farms to sell produce to the same group of people right but it feels like it it feels like that's not the case it feels like you're all kind of working towards a common goal i guess with a common enemy as well which is like big industrialized agriculture where it seems like that's almost helpful to be in the specific place where you are doing this because that's where other folks are, are doing similar. So it doesn't feel like, I don't even think there's a question in there. I, guess. I know right where you're at. Some people come into it and they see other people doing it and they think it, it's the competition, right? Because I think we've grown up with that mentality. But anybody that's kind of in it, you know, that grew up, grew up in farming or that is in it for other reason, you know, that's take, you know, just take a more humble approach really. Right. Um, you realize that's the cooperation, you know, and my, my skills as a farmer, I always say is only as good as all the contacts in my cell phone, because if I can't call someone that I know and trust and I can lean on, 
in the time when it's critical because that's going to happen then then you're screwed there's stuff to share there's what's going on is this happening to you what are you going to do about this what about those you know wages law the labor laws are changing in california in agriculture what are you doing you know i mean you got to bounce it around you if you just try to reinvent it um you're just going to lose like i said you just come in there you don't have experience you're gonna all the lessons you're going to be learning is going to cost you money and and that affects the sustainability of your farm so I think that the more you have a good relationship with all your neighbors, even if you don't like them, you know, but you're like, these are my neighbors. This is a very strategic friendship that I want to make, you know, that that's as good as your farm is, you know, as good as your relationship is with your neighbors and your landlords and all the other farmers around any contacts you have. I mean, that's just, that's all I consider all that part of dirty girl produce, but you yeah. know, all, all, all the relationships, you know, and also of course, all the customers. I, I agree. I think, I think in, in any industry, it's the relationships that you build that make the business stronger and not everybody realizes that it seems like farming's a ton of work. <laughs> like yeah. it seems like it's just a, an enormous amount of work, but you also sit on boards for education and sustainability. So I guess, how do you find time and why do you make time for those things as well as doing the work that you do, which is a lot of work? I'm involved in farmer's markets, which all have pretty much all have board of directors. It's kind of like you, you kind of have to pay your dues and you kind of have to, um, you know, it's like voting. You can't, you know, bitch about the system if you didn't vote, have a say in it, be active. So, you know, it's kind of like you got to take part everybody else is working for free on these boards and it's stimulating for me to be there. I've done it. You know, we've had good things in, in San Francisco. We've had big, you know, switches in the ownership of the ferry building and our le renegotiating a lease and, and just going over the footprint of our, our farmer's market, um, you know, square footage and stuff. And so that's like, yeah, I want to get in there because I want to be the farmer that fights for our farmer's market and for all of our farmers, you know, and I want to get in there and represent farm, you know, small scale organic farming to our city council and say, this is why it's important. There's a tendency in this digital economy to look at older industries like farming with a touch of disdain or classism. But what's interesting about Joe and Dirty Girl is that he's doing what tech companies think they're doing in terms of disruption, but through a lens of care and consideration, which big tech companies have mostly not done. When you're a David or a Joe going up against a Goliath, a monopoly in your industry, the story doesn't have to go that you took on the giant alone with your slingshot. It helps to have friends other folks in your industry with similar values, ways of doing things, and ideas about how an industry can change for the better. Other small businesses may not just be your competition, as you all share the same common goal of disrupting the same monopoly. So why not pool your resources and work together? I'm encouraged by Joe and the group of radical organic small farmers in Santa Cruz who wanted to change the world and are actively taking steps to do so. Next week, I'm talking to the daughter of two well-known indigenous artists who makes non-toxic paint without any plastic packaging. I hope you'll join me. Call Paul is a MailChimp original podcast. The show is made possible with the help of the whole amazing team, Julie Douglas, Ruth Eddy, Sasha Brown, Tierra Darnell, Kaida Jesus, and Zoe Culkin. Subscribe now on your favorite podcast player so you can check out all of our other episodes and seasons. Oh, and if you want more awesome podcasts, go to MailChimp.com slash presents.